Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, September 25th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, as the first week of absentee voting comes to a close, we check in with a county circuit clerk on the procedures and deadlines for casting an absentee ballot. Then, Mississippi is one of a number of states with a record of passing strict abortion laws that end up mired in the courts. We explore this trend in a Gulf State's newsroom roundtable. Plus, a Mississippi university offers a free public course on pandemics and infectious diseases. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. The number of Mississippians opting to vote absentee is on the rise due to the coronavirus pandemic. Rankin County Circuit Clerk Becky Boyd says her office has mailed out more than 1,200 applications with ballots since absentee voting began Monday. But as she explains with our Desiree Fraser, voting absentee in Mississippi requires careful attention to procedure. You have to have a reason. This is not early voting, it's absentee voting, so you have to have a reason. Anybody that's over 65 or disabled, we can mail it to you. Now, the over 65 will have to have it notarized. The disabled have to have it witnessed. Or, of course, they can come into the office and vote. If anyone is working out of town, we can mail it to their out-of-town address. We cannot mail it in town. Students, we can mail it to out-of-town. Military, we email theirs. Uh, if your work hours or say, like, a, we have a lot of nurses or a lot of poll workers that have to be at work from 7 to 7, they can come in the office and vote absentee. We're voting in the office. We started Monday, 8 to 5 every day, um, you know, Monday through Friday. We'll be voting Saturday, October the 24th from 8 to 12, and Saturday, October the 31st from 8 to 5, and that is the deadline. If you're quarantined, that's a new rule, right? Okay, well, if the doctor has quarantined you, then we can send you a disability. But if you have quarantined yourself just because you feel like that you shouldn't be around people, then that is not a reason. It has to be a doctor imposed, you know, from your family doctor, not just a doctor on TV, (laughs) you know, saying don't come. It has to be. If your doctor, like we had somebody that's having surgery in two weeks, and they called and said their doctor had told them, do not leave the house because he doesn't want to take a chance on him getting COVID before he has surgery. So that qualified as a disability. But, you know, if you're just saying, you know, I don't want to get out in the public, then that is not a reason. Do they have to provide a doctor's note with the application? No, but they sign it stating that they are telling the truth. Now, do you send out an application and then send out a ballot, or do you send them out together? We send them out together. But when they call us, they have to tell us what's going on because we have to know what kind of envelope to send. If it's disabled, they have to have it witnessed. If it's over 65, they have to have it notarized. So we, we ask them when they call, what is their reason? What reasons would there be that an absentee ballot would be rejected? Well, I don't have anything to do with that. Um, the, they have a resolution committee that looks at everything, and they make that decision. In terms of deadlines, getting an absentee ballot, is there a deadline for that? Well, it has to be, when when it's returned, it has to be postmarked by the day of the election. And we have to receive it within five working days after the election. What is the difference between mail-in voting and absentee voting? Okay, mail-in voting is still absentee. We just mail it to you. You, you call and request that it be mailed to you. Okay. But we don't just we don't do a blanket mail, mail out. Right? No, well, we have absentee mail in. If you call it, we don't have a blanket mail in. You have to call and request it, and you have to give us a reason. And then we mail it to you. How has the turnout been at your office? A big, big. <laughs> but we were expecting it to be big, yeah. 
if someone was infected with COVID-19 right before November 3rd, say the weekend mm-hmm. before or yep. that Monday, is there a way for them to vote? Well, we can mail it to them. But w- they wouldn't get it in time, right? Ma'am, I mean, I, that's all I, I mean, the rules are the rules, you know. If they call us, we'll mail it to them. Then they'd have to walk it into the office, I guess. No, 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 no. If we mail it, it has to come back through the mail. We can't mail you something and then you physically bring it in. If we mail it, it has to come back through the mail. So has the Secretary of State's office given any guidance on a last-minute COVID infection? It's it's always been, I mean, it's it's all, you know, we've, we've had people before that at the last minute have to be put in the hospital, and there's nothing we can do about that. You know, mm-hmm. if they call us and request it, we'll mail it to them. But, you know, we we, we, we can't control when they get it. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that's important for people to understand about voting? Okay. They need to know if they have moved, they need to make sure that we have their current address. If they have gotten married and changed their name, we need to make sure we have their correct name. Many, many, many times people move. They don't tell us that they've moved, but the post office notifies us that they've moved. So we mark them as being inactive. Then they go to the polls to vote, and their name is not on the voter roll. Well, it's not on the voter roll because they moved. So if anybody has moved, they need to call and make sure what address we have. If we don't have their current address, they need to put it in writing and give it to us. Is there a deadline for that? Okay, the deadline to register is October the 5th. Now, if they have moved within the county, we let them come in and change their address up until say like October the 30th, because we don't run the books until the voting is over with. So we can make changes within the county. But if they are new registrants, that has to be done by October the 5th. Becky Boyd is the circuit clerk for Rankin County. Voting during a pandemic provides new challenges for a Mitt County circuit clerk, Celeste McIntyre, especially if voters test positive or are given quarantine orders in the days immediately prior to Election Day. That is a tough question. I mean, if they, you mean if they have a confirmed case yeah, of coronavirus? If they, if they get coronavirus and they want to vote, what do they need to do? How, how do they handle that if they come to you? I can try to assist them to vote curbside. If, you know, I mean, we have told people to go and go to their poll and vote curbside. Because, I mean, if they're out of time to absentee, or if it's that, you know, I mean, the Saturday before we will be open, you know, I'm going to do my best to accommodate them and I minimize the risk to all people involved. You know, it's something that hasn't come up before. So it's that that's something that I will probably be asking our Secretary of State and his his attorney, you know, how we need to handle that if, and when, because it probably will happen when when that arises. Is there a deadline for requesting an absentee ballot? No, ma'am. If they call here the Saturday that we stop absentee voting, we will put one in the mail. You know, I, I have to warn them I can't guarantee you that it'll get to you in time. But then they would be quarantined and couldn't get to the circuit clerk's office to vote in person. Right, and I don't have a definite answer to that question. Celeste McIntyre is the circuit clerk for Amit County. All circuit clerk offices are open Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. People must wear a mask and social distance. Offices will also be open Saturdays, October 24th and 31st. The deadline to vote absentee in person is October 31st. Coming up, Mississippi is one of a number of states with a record of passing strict abortion laws that end up mired in the courts. We explore this trend in a Gulf States newsroom roundtable. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. The first question that we get when someone comes in is, how is the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library in Mississippi? Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. We have every letter Grant ever wrote and every letter ever written to him. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org radio 
or by using your favorite podcasting app, Mile Marker, a Mississippi Roads podcast. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. As President Donald Trump prepares to announce his nominee for the Supreme Court vacancy following the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, political and legal experts are watching carefully as the next judge could tilt the court to a strong conservative majority. Such a shift could affect a number of cases scheduled to go before the court this fall, including one of Mississippi's abortion restriction laws. Mississippi isn't alone in its quest to pass restrictions that challenge Roe v. Wade, the 1973 decision that legalized abortion nationally. Rosemary Westwood of WWNO in New Orleans joins us along with MPB's Desiree Frazier and Mary Ziegler, a professor of law at Florida State University, in part one of our Gulf States newsroom on abortion laws. Rosemary b- begins by explaining a Louisiana restriction law that was struck down this summer. So that was a law that was passed in 2014 and had been winding its way through the courts. It was the same law, in fact, that had been passed in Texas. And in 2016, the Supreme Court had struck down that provision in admitting privileges provision, it's called, and it requires abortion doctors to have the capacity to admit patients at hospitals within 30 miles of the clinics where they're performing abortions. And what Louisiana decided after the Supreme Court struck down Texas's law was not to capitulate, to continue to fight this, um, to distinguish the facts on the ground, as the state called it, between Texas and Louisiana. And when that case wound its way finally up to the Supreme Court, that was, I think, one of the key elements in the debate around this law. It wasn't really just the merits of this provision in Louisiana, but whether or not the court could find something invalid in one state and then valid the next state over. And when that law was struck down, it was seen as not a win for abortion rights necessarily in Louisiana, but a holding of the ground, you could call it. However, that ruling did not in any way expand the rights in Louisiana, and it has been used since to create um, to create arguments to uphold other laws in other states. So the Chief Justice's vote was not a full-throated endorsement by any means of abortion rights. Instead, it was on very narrow grounds that really kept things as is in Louisiana. Rosemary, how many abortion clinics are there in Louisiana? There are three right now. Desiree, we know that Mississippi has one abortion clinic Um, describe the issue of abortion from a legislative point of view, because the legislature is very strong among, if not all its members, uh, a majority. So talk about that a little bit. Mississippi has a Republican supermajority in the legislature, and abortion is an issue that comes up every year in legislation Um, over the past several years. Uh, You can expect to see an abortion bill among those that are uh, raised, and most of the time they passed. This legislative session, they passed a bill that restricts abortion based upon sex, race, and genetic abnormality. And Governor Tate Reeve signed that bill into law. And last year, Mississippi had the heartbeat bill Um, Yeah, um, 2018, the legislature passed the 15-week abortion ban. And then last year, as you mentioned, they passed the six-week ban, which is referred to as the fetal heartbeat ban because an abortion would not be allowed once a fetal heartbeat is detected. Both of those bills um, were signed into law but they were blocked by uh, a U.S. District Court judge, uh, specifically Judge Carlton Reeves. They went to the state, appealed to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, and they, they upheld the district court judge's ruling. The 15 week ban is scheduled to go to the U.S. Supreme Court 
uh, but that's in the California versus Texas uh, case in which attorneys general are bringing the 15 week ban issue. I believe there's 18 states, Mississippi is one of them. And the US Supreme Court is expected to hear oral arguments on that 15 week ban November 10th. Mary, these aren't just Louisiana laws or Mississippi laws, as Desiree just mentioned. Similar, if not identical measures have become law or are under consideration. Where, uh, who is the architect of these measures? Well, uh, the the pro life or anti abortion movement is, of course, a national movement. Um, it's, I guess, nerve center is in Washington D.C. Um, so some of the bills that you're looking at um, are the work of groups like Americans United for Life, which have pursued a kind of incremental death of a thousand cuts strategy to get rid of Roe v. Wade. Um, other laws like the heartbeat bills are the work of more kind of absolutist pro-life groups that believe that the time to overturn Roe v. Wade is now, um, and that that's even more true, of course, with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which means likely an additional conservative on the court and a kind of insurance policy, if you will. Um, Rosemary is right that Chief Justice Roberts is not uh, some kind of great friend to abortion rights. His opinion this summer created almost a roadmap um, for lawmakers um, in particular, Roberts redefined the rules that apply to all abortion restrictions and made it easier for lawmakers to argue that their restrictions were not unduly burdensome. But of course, now with an additional conservative on the court, that creates a kind of insurance policy. So even if Roberts were to join his more liberal colleagues, that wouldn't be enough. Um, that would be only four votes. So um, groups that are supporting heartbeat bills believe that they can almost force the court to confront Roe v. Wade immediately rather than waiting. So you, you have sort of two dueling pro-life or anti-abortion strategies unfolding, and um, all of them can be traced back to, to Washington, D.C. These are not purely local campaigns. Mary Ziegler is a professor at Florida State University College of Law. We say thanks to Rose Mary Westwood. She is a public reporter for WWNO in New Orleans and Desiree Frazier, legislative reporter at Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Thank you so much to all of you. Much appreciated. Thanks for having you. Thank you. Coming up, a Mississippi university offers a free public course on pandemics and infectious diseases. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Chris Boyd, host of Think, a call-in program coming to MPB Think Radio starting Monday, October 5th. Each day, I sit down with scientists, politicians, artists, and authors from around the globe for an in-depth conversation. Join me as we learn something new and take a moment to think. That's Think, starting Monday, October 5th. Coming to you weeknights at 10 on MPB Think Radio. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. A free online course that assists in understanding COVID-19 and related pandemic topics is now available to the public thanks to the work of faculty and staff at the University of Southern Mississippi. Understanding the Pandemic, a COVID-19 public service short course, contains six modules and is the brainchild of Dr. Douglas Masterson, Senior Associate Provost for Institutional Effectiveness and Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry at USM. The course came about uh, as I was thinking about um, all of the things and information that people are are hearing from various media outlets and on social media and how confusing that could be. And I realized that, you know, we have a lot of uh, faculty members who are uh, content area experts that in, in things that could be um, important to people, for people to understand uh, this pandemic. And so that that's really how it came about was understanding that we had people who were experts in the area here and had, had something that uh, they could share with, with the public in, in general. You have six modules, the first being the history of pandemics. So I'm interested in this. Do you go back before the 1918 pandemic or do you start with that? No, it goes back. It goes back uh, well before that. It goes back into some ancient times, uh, and and that's actually taught by our uh, a biology professor, uh, Dr. Janet Donaldson, uh, who is currently actually teaching a, a full fledged course. 
if you will, on the history of pandemics. And so she took uh, pieces of what she was delivering uh, to her students here on campus and and made that available for this uh, free public course that we that we put together. Number three is coronavirus and epidemiology. Now, as I understand it, coronavirus applies to a, a lot of different viruses because when this one came about, it was called the novel coronavirus. Yeah, it is. It is a novel coronavirus. That, that's correct. It is. It is a. It is a new type of coronavirus. But cr- there are n- numerous coronaviruses, and that and that particular uh, module is presented by a, a biologist again, Dr. Feng Wei Bai, uh, who st- uh, spends an awful lot of time studying viruses. And so he goes through uh, how uh, the novel coronavirus is similar to other coronaviruses. So he t- does talk a little bit about that, but then talks about what's different about it. Uh, as well. So uh, people can understand that we, you know, as humans, we've been living with coronaviruses for quite some time, but this this one is different. Number four, the spread, the prevention, and treatment. Is that for this particular coronavirus? Uh, it focuses an awful lot on this on this uh, coronavirus. That's true. And th- this one, uh, you know, we were really um, uh, pleased with this particular module. Of course, we're pleased with all of the modules, but you know, this one really highlighted, I think, a lot of what um, Southern Miss has been doing to help the community. So uh, Dr. Lazary, um, again, is a, um, a professor in, in biology, and, and he started doing some uh, on, on-site uh, test processing. So they actually process uh, coronavirus tests uh, in, within his laboratory spaces uh, here to help us uh, know who has coronavirus and who and who doesn't, uh, and uh, it, it was really a, a nice module that was put together by him. But also, you know, we've got people from public health, we've got people from uh, nur- the nursing program that were also contributing to that particular module, as well as uh, two uh, physicians from uh, both Hattiesburg Clinic and Forest General Hospital here in Hattiesburg contributed to to that particular module. So it, it really was a uh, a multi-person module that talks about the treatment and, and and it does talk a little bit about prevention and other things as well. You have quite a list of experts for all of these different modules. You've brought a lot of people together. That's right. Yeah, we, we did that intentionally. Uh, I'm, I'm a chemist by training and I really had no uh, expertise to offer for COVID-19, uh, but I knew we had that expertise across campus and that, that was the goal was to bring the people that, that had the expertise um, and, and we're willing to share that with, with the public at, at large. I was, I was really proud of the group that we were able to bring together and their willingness to actually do this on a volunteer basis to, to put this course together as, as quickly as we did. Dr. Masterson, tell us how this is going to be presented. Is it videos online? They are videos. We actually have it in our uh, learning management system, as we call it, which is, which is run by Canvas. Uh, and there's a, it's, it's been made publicly available. And so we have on our website uh, several locations on our website where uh, people can click on the link and actually get in there and view all of the video materials. We do have some quizzes and a certificate of completion, but that's only currently available for people who are members of the USM community. But anybody can actually access all of the the video resources that are that are online and you know go through each one of those at their own pace, however they want to do that. And how do people? Uh, where do they go so they can watch it? Well, they can go just straight to our uh, USM uh, website, uh, and we have information up on a, a, a little banner that, that uh, pops up at the top of the screen that's about COVID-19. And if they click on that link, it'll there will be uh, information on that free public course embedded there. I believe it's also going to be on the Moffitt Health Center website, and so uh, there will be a number of ways that, that folks will be able to access it. I would imagine you're going to have a lot of interest. Our listeners, are I know their ears have perked up already, and <laughs> I think you're going to have a lot of people watch these videos. Understanding the Pandemic is the name of the course, and we've been speaking with Dr. Douglas Masterson. He's the Senior Associate Provost for Institutional Effectiveness and Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Southern Mississippi. Thank you so much for this information. Looking forward to seeing it. Well, thank you very much, and I hope people uh, log in and and, uh, enjoy and get what they need out of the course. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. 
Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening.